All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Prabhasha, and today I'm going to be teaching you guys about SCH3U or Grade 11 Chem. Now, before I get started, I'd like to make a quick introduction on myself and who we are. I am part of a group called Passionate Mind, and our goal right now is to currently teach and help tutor young students on subjects that they might turn to be learning but aren't able to learn because they're at home right now and not at school. Uh, we're just doing some different courses online, making some videos like this to help you guys out. And my course that I'm helping teach is a CH3U. This first lecture is mainly going to be um, a bit of repetition, some review from grade 10, and we're going to be introducing significant physics to you guys today. And um, the real content, um, atomic bonding and all that, will be starting next week, during the next lecture. Uh, to start off, I'm going to be introducing some hazardous symbols you guys might not know. Now, in grade 11 chem, you're going to be doing a lot more labs hands-on that require the use of potentially hazardous and dangerous chemicals. So it is very important that you guys understand what each of these symbols represent when handling different substances. Uh, to start, we have the flammable symbol, which is simply a the corrosive symbol has changed from before. It used to be just the hand, but now we have the two test tubes right here, one going on the hand, the other on a surface. Um, the radioactive symbol uh, symbolizes biohazardous infectious materials. The O that is up in flames represents oxidizer. This one's particularly dangerous because it means that in the presence of oxygen, this material will so you're probably not going to deal with it, but it is very good to know in case. Um, with the silhouette of a person, you have the health hazard. This is more general. Um, harmful or irritant substances have the exclamation mark. This one's actually not as bad as toxic or corrosive. It's still good to be aware of irritants. The compressed gas symbol is simply a symbol of a compressed gas cylinder. Uh, you have the explosive symbol up here and the toxic symbol, skull and crossbones. Now, a couple definitions that you guys should know are matter, which is everything that occupies space that has mass. Everything is made up of atoms. Everything around you, your cell phone, the device you're using to listen to this, your body, everything is made up of atoms and everything is made up of matter. A mixture is a material that's created by mixing two or more substances together. You're going to either have a homogeneous mixture, a mixture that appears the same throughout, for example, water, air, when you dissolve sugar into coffee, steel, these all appear the same. They don't have differences in them. A heterogeneous mixture is a mixture that appears distinct from one another. For example, if you have water and you put some oil into it, going to sit atop the water, creating a mixture of two different things that are distinct. With a chocolate chip cookie, you're going to have the chocolate chips, which are spread apart the cookie, and there's going to be spaces in between the cookie that don't have chocolate chips, making this area distinct from each other. With sand water, you're going to have sand that sinks to the bottom, um, not being able to be dissolved in water. And with cloudy air, you have uh, clear skies and you have clouds, which are different from each other are distinct from each other. Um, going off of homogeneous mixtures, a pure substance is a substance that has a constant composition. So there's only one type of element or compound present throughout the composition. This is also homogeneous, they go hand in hand. Um, with pure substances, you're looking at elements, which are pure substances that cannot be broken down anymore. So all the atoms on the periodic table the substances that can't be broken down anymore. The compounds are two or more elements bonded together. So, for example, water, um, if one of the elements is bonded, uh, sugar, glucose, that sort of thing, two or more atoms, uh, two or more elements are bonded together. Uh, now, taking a quick look at the periodic table, this is just going to be a rough look at the periodic table. We'll go more into the periodic table in the future lectures. But we have here the metals, which are highlighted in yellow. 
all of these up to here. The non-metals, which are from the carbon, uh, phosphorus, you have selenium, iodine, and all the others. And then you have the metalloids, which are a staircase-like area, which are right in between metals and non-metals. So properties are distinct from both of them, and I'll be going into this more later on. Uh, when you're looking at the periodic table, you're going to be looking at both the period and the group when defining uh, where a element is on the table, if you're trying to define it. The group is the column that the element is in. So you have groups one, two, you technically skip these. This would normally be considered three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. And then for periods, you have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These molecules right here, these are all considered transition metals, meaning that um, their composition is a bit more different than, say, the ones in groups one, two, three, four. They're all relatively similar with each other, and we'll be going into this more later on. Now, um, just a quick one more thing to let you guys know. Uh, group 7 down here, this would be the group of halogens. So these are all nonmetals, which are very reactive. And then group 8 is going to be the um, noble gases, ones which are inert. They don't react. And this is just a quick uh, recap. Uh, if we go back, group one right here is going to be the alkali metals, and then group two, alkaline earth. Alkaline metals are going to be more reactive than alkaline earth, and we'll be going into this more later on. All right, now uh, to um, cap off, we're going to be talking about significant digits. Significant digits are very important digits in chemistry, and they help you give information about how accurate your values and results are. To give a quick example, if you have 99% success rate on something, say the uh, the success rate of the LRT, for example, we all know it's not 99%, but if it was 99%, we consider this value to be pretty accurate. However, with a value of 99.99999%, a value with two, three, seven significant digits. This is much more accurate due to the fact that it has more significant digits than 99. Um, you could also turn this around and say 20%, 21% is accurate, yet 21.23756 is much more accurate than just 21%. When looking at significant digits, we have a couple of rules that we need to follow. All non-zero numbers are going to be significant. <clears throat> For example, the number 231, all of the numbers, all the digits are non-zero, so it's going to have three significant digits. The zero in between two non-zero numbers is also going to be significant. If you take a number like 305 or 909 or 101, this number is also going to have three significant digits because the zero is in between two non-zeros. Now, if you have a leading zero for whatever reason, this is not going to be significant. So 0 0.0021 or uh, has two significant digits. 0 0.0001 has one significant digit. 067.3 has three significant digits and so forth. Any leading zeros are not going to be significant. Now, when you're looking at trailing zeros, trailing zeros to the right of the decimal point are going to be significant. So if they're after the decimal point, they will always be significant. For example, 94.510 has five significant digits. Every digit here is significant. But when you're looking at trailing zeros without a decimal point, they are not significant. So 94,508 is only three significant digits. This trailing zero here is not significant. When looking at trailing zeros with a decimal point in the number, however, they're always going to be significant. So if you had 94,510 with a decimal point right here, every single digit here is going to be significant, giving you six significant digits. Um, looking at a couple examples, 952.01, since the zero is after the decimal point, all the digits are going to be significant. You're going to have five. 31,000, 
zero, uh, 31,009, the zeros are not at the end, they're in between two non-zeros, so they're all going to be significant. There's five significant digits. Looking at 4502, since the zero is at the beginning, it's going to be insignificant always. It's going to have four significant digits in this, mode, in this number. Uh, looking at 0 0.9013, since we do have a leading zero, that's going to be insignificant. The rest of them are. You're going to have four significant digits. When we look at 31,000, since there's no decimal place and all the trailing zeros are trailing and there's no decimal place, which is what we're looking at, we're going to have two significant digits for this number. Looking at 31,000.0, however, since we do have a decimal place, all of the digits here are significant, every single one of them. Looking at 0 0.5020, oh, 452, 0.5020, oh, the leading zero is going to be insignificant, but every other digit is significant in the zero because there is a decimal point, meaning that there's going to be five significant digits in this number. And to finally to cap it off, 450. These two zeros here are insignificant because the leading zeros are always insignificant and the trailing zeros without a decimal point are also going to be insignificant, giving you two dec uh, significant digits for this, for this number. Now, when adding and subtracting significant digits as these, the answers cannot be more precise than the least accurate measurement. For example, it'd be wrong to say that 3 plus 9.9999 is going to be 12.9999 because we don't know how accurate 3 is. If 3 had the same number of decimal places as 9.9999, so 4, this would be accurate. But since this isn't the case, we can't make that assumption. The rules for adding and subtracting significant digits are to add and subtract the number normally through a calculator or add them up while you're writing them down. Then round this answer that you get to the same amount of decimal places as the number with the lowest decimal places. So I'll give you an example, 1.001 plus 3.3, 1.001 1 .001 has three decimal places, so 1, 2, 3, but 3.3 3 only has one. So the answer is only going to have one decimal place. So if you plug this into your calculator, I'll just do it right now, you're going to get 4.301. Now the answer is 4.3 because you only take one decimal place from this number. If we're doing 5.934 minus 3, this number has no decimal places, so the answer will also have none. The, the regular answer that if you plug it into your calculator would be 2.934, but this rounds up to 3 because you only have, you have 0 decimal places, and 9 rounds up to, to the nearest 10. We give a couple more examples, 4.513 minus 2.31. This has three decimal places, 2.31 has two, the answer is going to have two, the answer is going to be 2.19, two decimal places. Now you take 4.513 minus 2.3021, this has three decimal places, while this one has four, so the answer is going to have three, the, uh, the lower value. The answer is going to be 2.211 once you plug it into the calculator and round it. Now 2.31 plus 9, minus 4.4. 2.31 has two decimal places, 4.4 has one, but 9 has none. This means that the answer is also going to have none, and you're going to have to round it up. The regular answer would have been 6.91, but 9 rounds up, so the answer is just going to be 7. All right. Now, multiplying and dividing significant digits. The rule for this is the answer will have the same amount of significant digits as the number with the least amount of significant digits. So when you look back at adding and subtracting, it's about the lowest decimal places. When you're looking at multiplying and dividing, it's about significant digits, the lower amount of significant digits versus the lower amount of decimal places for adding and subtracting. It's very important to know the distinction between the two because um, if you do get them mixed up, even if your answer is close, it will be considered wrong in the eyes of teachers because your significant digit rounding will be incorrect. When you take the example 34 plus 9.32, you got two significant digits here versus three. The answer is going to have two. 
just plug it into your calculator and round it. So the answer is going to be 320 because the zero here is insignificant because we don't have any decimal places. If you take 901 and divide that by 4.321, 901 has three significant digits while 4.321 has four. The answer is going to have three. It's going to give you 209. You look at 3.351 times 90, one significant digit versus four. The answer is only going to have one, so 300. Because the regular answer 301.59 will round down. 534.21 times 88, two significant digits versus five. The answer is going to have two. You're going to get 4.7 times 10 to the five. Now I'm going to be introducing to you scientific notation, which is the way I wrote out this last answer. Scientific notation is an easier way to differentiate exactly how many significant digits are going to be in your measurements. For example, instead of saying 390,901, you can say 3.9091 times 10 to the 5. Scientific notation increases in powers of 10. So 10 to the power of 0 is going to be 1, 10 to the power of 1 is going to be 10, 10 to the power of 2, 100, 10 to the power of 3, 1000, and so on and so forth. Um, we use scientific notation just to clearly see how many significant digits are going to be when a value. If you take 32.31 times 94.5, the lowest number of significant digits here is going to be 3, so the answer should have 3. Instead of writing 3005, 3050, we can write 3.05 times 10 to the 3 which is the same answer, just much more clear to see. And you're not going to make any mistakes with trailing zeros or um, or leading zeros or anything like that. Uh, if we take 9.1 times 400, this answer is only going to have one significant digit because 4 here is the only significant digit in 400. So instead of writing 4,000 and not knowing exactly how many uh, significant digits are, if someone looking at it, you can just write 4 times 10 to the 3, make it a bit easier. And that is it for today. Um, in the next lecture, like I said, I'll be going over atomic notation, atomic uh, theory, a bit of history as well, and really get into the specifics of this course. But this was mainly uh, an introduction to you guys on knowing how to deal with significant digits and just looking at the periodic table for a bit. All right.